Hey there. Welcome back to Bong's Anatomy. Ever thought about what's working behind the scenes to keep you standing tall and moving freely? Well, it's time to meet the powerhouse team of muscles in your back. The intrinsic back muscles. These deep, often overlooked muscles are the true heroes behind your posture and spine stability. So, if you're ready to discover what keeps you upright, balanced, and in motion, let's jump right in. I know, I know you're probably thinking, this is a lot. But don't worry, to make things way easier, I've whipped up a flowchart that'll guide us through this step by step. It's like a cheat sheet, but cooler. First things first, what makes a back muscle intrinsic? Intrinsic muscles start and end in the back, meaning they're designed specifically for spinal support and movement. These muscles run deep, hidden beneath the larger, superficial muscles like the trapezius and latissimus dorsi. And here's a helpful hint. Every intrinsic back muscle is innervated by the posterior or dorsal rami of the spinal nerves. To understand these muscles, a few quick terms can help. When you hear capitis, think head, like captain or capital. Services? That's neck. Thoracis points to the thorax and lumborum refers to the lumbar area, or lower back. Segmental group muscles? Before we jump into each region, let's cover a special group of segmental muscles that repeat along the spine. These include the interspinals, which run between spinous processes to stabilize the spine, and the inner transversarii, found between transverse processes. Both muscles help with spine stability, Though inner transversarii is generally missing in the mid-thoracic area. Cervical region? Starting with the cervical region, our first question is, can you see the articular pillars? If yes, you've reached the deepest layer. Above the spinous process of the axis, or C2, we enter the suboccipital group. These four muscles are essential for head movement. Let's start with the straight muscles. So, first off, when we talk about rectus capitis, the word rectus comes from Latin, meaning straight, and capitis means head. So, when we say rectus capitis, we're referring to muscles that run straight toward the head. Now, these muscles are located on the posterior side of your neck, which is why we call them rectus capitis posterior. But here's the thing. There are two distinct muscles on the back of the neck, and the key difference between them is their size. Rectus capitis posterior minor a small but powerful extensor of the head. This muscle originates from the posterior arch of the atlas and inserts into the inferior nuchal line. Rectus capitis posterior major. Slightly larger, this muscle originates from the axis's spinous process and also inserts near the nuchal line, but more laterally. It's responsible for both extending and rotating the head. Then, there's the oblique muscles. Obliquus capitis superior. This oblique muscle originates from the atlas's transverse process and inserts lateral to the rectus capitis posterior major, allowing head extension and lateral flexion. Obliquus capitis inferior, originating from the axis's spinous process and inserting into the atlas's transverse process, it helps with head rotation. Now, if we zoom in on the back of your neck, the rectus capitis posterior major, obliquus capitis superior, and obliquus capitis inferior muscles form a kind of triangle, which is known as the suboccipital triangle. This is a really important anatomical space because within this triangle, you'll find some key structures. First, there's the suboccipital nerve, which innervates the muscles in this area. You'll also see the vertebral artery, which supplies blood to the brain, and the vertebral veins, which help drain blood from the brain. So, not only is this triangle a key landmark for muscle function, but it also gives us access to these vital nerves and blood vessels. Transition to more superficial layers. Now, moving just below the suboccipital muscles, we reach the semispinalis cervices. Look for a muscle attached to the spinous process of the axis from below. That's our semispinalis cervices. It's a key extensor of the neck and head. And above that, we lose sight of the articular pillars, meaning we're getting more superficial. Here, we meet the splenius muscles, which looks like a plaster along the head and neck. Splenius capitis, 
originating from cervical spinous processes, this muscle inserts into the mastoid process and occipital bone, helping rotate the head. Splenius cervices, originating from upper thoracic spinous processes and inserting into upper cervical transverse processes, it rotates the head and works alongside splenius capitis. Finally, moving medial to the splenius capitis, we come across the semispinalis capitis. This muscle is deeper and plays an important role in both extending and rotating the head. The semispinalis capitis originates from the transverse processes of the C4 to C7 vertebrae and the thoracic vertebrae, T1 to T6. It then inserts onto the occipital bone of the skull, just below the superior nuchal line. When it contracts, the semispinalis capitis helps extend the head. Think of tilting your head backward and it also contributes to rotating the head to the opposite side. For example, when the right side of the semispinalis capitis contracts, it will rotate the head to the left. Thoracic region? In the thoracic region, the main question is, can we see the transverse processes? If yes, check if the muscle lies medial or lateral. Laterally, there's the levator costarum, a muscle that lifts the ribs. It originates from C7, to T11 transverse processes and inserts into the ribs costal angle. Medially, we see the rotators, which go from transverse processes to laminae and spinous processes of the vertebrae one to two levels above, helping rotate the thorax. If you don't see the transverse process, it's likely covered by the erector spiny group. Remember the mnemonic. I love spine, iliacostalis, longissimus, and spinalis. Spinalis connects spinous processes to spinous processes. Longissimus connects transverse processes to transverse processes. Iliacostalis goes from costal angles of the ribs to other costal angles or transverse processes. These muscles are key for lateral flexion when working on one side and extension when activated on both sides. Lumbar region. Now, let's move to the region lateral to the transverse processes of the vertebrae. Here, we find the quadratus lumborum, a muscle that's often tested alongside the intrinsic back muscles. The quadratus lumborum is not an intrinsic back muscle, meaning it doesn't directly act on the spine itself. Instead, it's primarily involved in movements of the lumbar spine and pelvis. Because it's not intrinsic, it's innervated by the anterior rami of the spinal nerves, unlike the intrinsic back muscles, which are typically innervated by the posterior rami. This muscle originates from the iliac crest and the iliolumbar ligament, and it inserts into the 12th rib and the transverse processes of L1 to L4 vertebrae. Its main function is to assist with lateral flexion of the trunk and help stabilize the lumbar spine, kind of like the way the erector spiny muscles stabilize the spine, though the quadratus lumborum does this in a more lateral and more focused manner. Medial to the transverse processes, we can find the multifidus. This muscle gets its name from its structure. It's divided into many segments, with fibers running from the transverse processes of one vertebra to the spinous processes of another. These short fibers allow the multifidus to provide stabilization to the spine, especially during movements. The multifidus muscle spans the entire length of the spine. However, it is most prominent in the lumbar region. It originates from the lateral aspects of the vertebrae, including the sacrum, ilium, and transverse processes of the lumbar and thoracic vertebrae. It inserts into the spinous processes of the vertebrae two or three levels above its origin. Its primary function is to stabilize the spine, particularly during rotation and lateral flexion, ensuring that vertebrae stay aligned and don't move too much during more complex movements. Just like in the thoracic region, the transverse processes here are also covered by the erector spiny muscles. Let's break down what each of these muscles does, following the same pattern. Spinalis. Connecting spinous processes to spinous processes, spinalis lies closest to the midline and provides stability along the spine. Longissimus. This muscle bridges transverse processes to other transverse processes, acting as lateral support for the spine. Iliacostalis. Unique within the erector spiny. Iliacostalis has a section called lumborum that reaches the lumbar region. It originates from the iliac crest, sacrum, and thoracolumbar fascia, 
and inserts into the costal angles of the ribs and lumbar transverse processes, contributing to lateral flexion and extension. So, there you have it. A deep dive into the intrinsic back muscles, from the cervical region to the lumbar. Whether you're studying for exams or just fascinated by human anatomy, remember, repetition is the key to mastering this. So grab a piece of paper and try drawing out your own flowchart. It's the best way to make this knowledge stick. Before finishing up, let's go through again quickly. Interspinals. Intertransversarii. Rectus capitis posterior minor. Rectus capitis posterior major. Obliquus capitis superior. Obliquus capitis inferior. Semispinalis cervices. Splenius capitis. Splenius cervices. Semispinalis capitis. Levator costarum. Rotators. Spinalis. Longissimus. Iliacostalis. Quadratus lumborum. Multifidus. Spinalis. Longissimus. Iliacostalis. Thanks for watching. If you found this video helpful, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And check out our other videos to keep building your anatomy knowledge. See you next time.